Great. Thanks, Mina. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, and that is uh, Danielle Potuma. And I can she see that she is alive and, and well, <laughs> and that's great because she wasn't able to, to be here in person, and that's too bad. So we miss you, Danielle. But nevertheless, it's great that you have uh, pre-recorded your talk and you'll be present for the, the Q&A uh, afterwards. So Danielle is a professor of statistical genetics at the Freie Universität in Amsterdam. And uh, she's also head of the Department of, uh, of Complex Trait Genetics. And she has received numerous prizes and prestigious uh, research grants, like the ERC, for instance. Uh, her main focus is, is, is developing tools, analytical tools for analyzing uh, genetic data and for annotating genetic data. So she has developed, uh, for instance, a very widely used uh, tools called MACMA for gene set uh, and gene analysis, gene-based analysis, and also uh, FUMA for, for uh, for annotating genetic findings and making, you know, trying to make sense of that into, into a biological context. So with that word, I look very much forward to, to hear your talk, Danielle. So please go ahead. Thank you very much, Anders. You can uh, hear me, uh, I assume. Yeah. Yes, okay. Well, thanks for the nice introduction and also like to thank uh, the other organizers for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, I'm sorry not to be there in person. I did uh, intend to, uh, to, be, uh, to be there in person, but I had a very unplanned uh, holiday um, that spontaneously occurred. So I'm also happy that we uh, now have this uh, uh, opportunity to have hybrid events. So sorry to miss you, but uh, I'm also happy to, uh, to be able to do this, um, from this uh, in this way. So in the next um, 50 or 60 minutes, I intend to walk you through some of the, the, the work that we've been doing in my lab for the last two to three years, but also some of the tools that we're currently working on. And I would like to give you a very brief overview of part of the field uh, in the way that we are looking at it from our point of view. So it's going to be from GWAS to function. And uh, I would like to start with this uh, cartoon that I often use in presentation. Um, and uh, I always like to look at this from, you know, when, we, when I started my PhD, we could only uh, evaluate what is the heritability of a trait, but then uh, the revolution in genotyping occurred, and then we could actually genotype um, large data samples and, and data sets. And now we are actually able to genotype over a million of individuals and even have sequencing data. And this, yeah, this really went on from the 1990s to where we are now, just a couple of decades. Uh, and I think it's a true revolution. And I, I still think it's amazing if you look back at it from where we are now and what we could do just a couple of years ago. I think it's really amazing that, uh, that this is how far we've come already. But if you would draw this line a little bit up and if you would come back uh, in 10 or 20 years, I think we would actually be able to know a little bit more and get, gain more insight into mechanism. And that actually is the ultimate goal of uh, what my group is currently working on, to facilitate um, that we can gain insight into mechanisms underlying brain disorders by using genetic data and developing analytical tools that help us to interpret um, the, the results of, uh, of, of genetic discovery studies. And um, yeah, and this, because there's so much data coming out, new data coming out, new tools have to be developed, uh, new ways of interpreting the data have to be developed. And uh, yeah, it's always an exciting era to, uh, to be working in, I think. So if you look back at genome-wide discoveries in uh, 2020 or 2023 right now, I think genome-wide genome has really matured in the last decade from being a very small study, including only a couple of hundred individuals, to now including over a million individuals. And even the latest uh, study for height um, included more than five million individuals. So it, and it's almost a saturated map of uh, the heritability of, of uh, complex traits. So I think when we look back at GWAS studies and where we are now, we, we can truly say that the current GWAS studies, um, they generate replicable results. They uh, give us highly reliable outcomes. And there's actually something in there that we should, should be able to use to make us understand a little bit more about the underlying mechanism. 
But as I will tell you later, this, and I think most of you know, it's not that straightforward. Um, but we know that, that um, there's information in there. So um, there are a couple of outstanding challenges for GWAS that make it a little bit more difficult to go from, uh, from function to insight or to go from GWAS results to functional um, insight. And these are the four challenges that we are currently working on, but there's a couple of more challenges, obviously, that other people might also be working on. So I think one of the challenges that many people are working on now is to increase diversity. Most of the samples that we're currently using for GWAS studies are relying on European samples um, and do not really include Asian samples or, uh, or African samples, for example, or Hispanic samples. If you would increase this, there are basically two main uh, benefits of doing this. One, we would increase uh, the generalizability of our findings, but secondly, we would also be able to use the differences in LD between different populations to zoom in on the risk loci that we find and to be able to do a much better prediction of what is the most likely causal uh, gene in the locus that we find. So there's several different ways of, uh, several different reasons of the need for increasing diversity. Um, and uh, from my uh, own experience um, in, the, in the PGC, the, the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, we are currently focusing very much on trying to include samples that are non-European. Uh, this is sometimes a little bit challenging because these samples uh, tend to be small, they tend to be uh, genotyped on different panels. It's not always straightforward to include them in a meta-analysis. It's also not always uh, very um, easy to collaborate with people because it's far away, so that's just a physical constraint, but it's also because there's not already a collaboration ongoing. Um, and uh, yeah, you really, really need to set a way to, um, to facilitate this, but there's a lot of effort to, uh, to make this a little bit more, uh, more feasible. Um, so that's uh, at least one thing that um, I'm currently working on at the PGC Alzheimer Working Group to, uh, to, f to facilitate this. And I think also in the, in the larger consortium, people are also doing this. So this is a very good initiative, I think. Second outstanding challenge for GWAS is to refine our phenotypes. I think most of the GWAS have focused in the beginning on increasing our sample size, and that went a little bit at the cost of the phenotypes uh, that we included. For example, uh, when we would focus on intelligence, um, the larger sample sizes included educational attainment, which is a good proxy for intelligence, but it's a less refined phenotype. It contains a little bit more error. Um, it's easier to, to phenotype, easier to measure, but it comes at the cost of, uh, of, uh, of accuracy. And I think nowadays when, um, when genotyping costs have uh, lowered, it's maybe also time to, uh, to also include phenotypes that are a little bit more refined and more difficult to measure, but have a little bit more information value. So I think that's also one of the things uh, that some groups are currently focusing on. And uh, I will have one example in the next slide where we uh, also are doing this. Um, another outstanding challenge for GWAS is to understand pleiotropy. And that's also something that we've seen only after we've run so many different GWASs and we found that there are so many correlations between the findings uh, of these GWASs, uh, meaning that uh, the same genes and the same genetic variants are often associated with many different traits. And it's, uh, it might be interesting to know, you know, why do we see these correlations? Is there uh, a direct causal uh, link between different traits? Is there a reason why certain diseases are comorbid, for example? Is that link due to a shared genetic mechanism or is there a direct effect of one trait on the other? And understanding these causal um, and the direction of causation between these genetic relationships might be very informative also uh, for treatment for for example, or for prevention. So that's also one area that I think um, is currently very, uh, yeah, very hot topic in, in GWAS. Then um, the last outstanding challenge on the slide is to translate GWAS finding into mechanistic insights. So most of the, um, the things that I will talk about uh, today is about this last challenge, uh, because that's, I think, one of the hardest challenges, but it's also um, yeah, one of the um, most exciting challenges to to use the results that we have from VIVAS to gain uh, further insight into, uh, into the, the real mechanism, what, ha what really happens in the brain, what happens at the molecular level, what happens at the cellular level. Uh, so I will be mainly talking about that, but we'll have two brief examples about the other ones. So uh, on more in-depth phenotyping, 
Um, we, as many other people, use uh, the beautiful resource of Yuka Biobank, where there's a lot of phenotyping available. Uh, and one of the, pheno, one of the uh, real more phenotypes that's available is um, MRI scans from the brain. And these can obviously be used to look a little bit more in depth. Um, those MRI scans are not yet available for the whole Yuka Biobank sample. So the, the sample size is a little bit lower, but still the effect sizes are also quite uh, large. So here, We've already conducted some a little bit more in-depth phenotyping, but there's also other groups around the world that have used the same data set um, to, um, to look more into um, more uh, biological measures of cognitive function, for example, or look at more biological measures of how the brain is wired or how different parts of the brain are connecting to each other. And that might help us to also when we link this back to diseases to, um, to gain a better understanding um, of what's happening uh, in the context of disease at a biological or molecular level. Uh, another uh, study we've just um, uh, finished, uh, which was led by Sophie van der Sluis, who's one of the PIs in my lab, uh, with her PC student, Cato Romero, uh, was just published where they looked at um, the overlap between many different psychiatric disorders and how uh, that overlap could be um, investigated at, uh, at the genetic level, where they looked at um, uh, the overlap between single genetic variants, but also the overlap between the genes that are involved, the overlap between sets of genes that are involved, and also at the overlap between a different cell types that might be involved uh, at different um, for different phenotypes. Um, there's no, um, it, it's very difficult to do any causal modeling. Of course, we can do Mendelian randomization, for example. Uh, and part of that was also done uh, within the study. But it's difficult to really draw um, definite conclusions based on this. But it's good to make this, to have this map of how strong the correlations are between the different um, types of psychiatric disorders and um, between which types of psychiatric disorders these correlations are strongest, for example. Um, so that can be found in this, uh, this paper that was just uh, published um, in the beginning of this year. And then, yeah, so the last challenge I would like to talk about a little bit more in depth is to translate GWAS finding into mechanistic insight. So uh, when we look at this revolution in genetics, we say, well, you know, we went from only being able to look at the heritability estimates to now being able to do these huge sample sizes where we have reliable, replicable um, findings from GWAS. And then um, we would basically naively maybe expect to immediately gain mechanistic insight. At least that's what, what I was expecting when I did my first GWAS a couple of years ago. I said, well, I know this trait is heritable. That was depression. Um, this will be the first GWAS that we're going to do for depression. We will scan the whole genome. We will find all of the statistical association between genetic variants and uh, the depressive phenotype. And then immediately that will give us insight into the underlying biology. But obviously that didn't happen, and it's still not happening for many of the brain-related disorders that we're currently looking at. And that's because our GWAS um, Manhattan plots look like this plot from uh, Stefan Ripke's paper for schizophrenia, so published in 2014, where we see a lot of very uh, significant uh, statistical association, but it's also so many that it's very difficult to interpret what is the exact biology. Um, and uh, we also don't know from all of these loci, what are the actual genes? So I will go a little bit more into that, uh, also into that in the next slide, uh, after, after explaining why we actually do need mechanistic insight. So one of the, yeah, the main reasons to make, gain mechanistic insight is, I think for me, is to understand, you know, why do people differ? What happens at the molecular level? What happens at the cellular level? And can we then use that information to maybe develop novel treatments or maybe to, um, uh, to treat people different at school, for example, if the trait that we're looking at is intelligence, then I would like to know how does it work internally in a person's brain? Does this person need to be uh, taught in a different way uh, compared to that person? Or if in, in the context of depression, does this person need a different treatment for depression than that person? So we would like to understand why do people differ but also what happens at the cellular level and what is the best personalized um, treatment for, for a specific person. 
so that's why I think it's really important to uh, to gain this mechanistic insight. Of course, if you're only interested in prediction, um, then you could use the results of GWA studies without having any further mechanistic insight, but you could still predict which person is at higher risk than another person without knowing anything about the underlying mechanism. And for that, it's maybe not important. But even then, I would say if you would be able to predict, it would be also nice to treat people. So again, then it would be nice to, uh, to have a little bit more insight into the underlying biology. But then uh, why is it so difficult? So uh, at the one hand, we have these genetics. So we have all these beautiful g -waters. We have found all of the genes, well, mo all, almost all of the genes uh, for many of the traits that we are investigating. And then we expect that neurobiology will immediately give us the answer, but that's unfortunately not how it works. If the traits that we would investigate were all monogenic traits that were influenced by just one single gene, then finding that sing single gene would actually be a very good indication uh, for setting up a functional experiment and then sorting out what is the underlying biology. But in our case, when we're investigating brain-related disorders that are highly complex and highly polygenic, our genes, um, if we can actually find the causal or indicate what is the most likely causal gene, then we still have a lot of genes that have a very small effect. And um, asking our neurobiological colleagues to tell us to uh, solve the riddle of what is the underlying biology by giving them these buckets of genes that are small effect size, we don't even know for sure whether they're actually causally related, doesn't really help them. Uh, and it doesn't really give us an answer yet. So this is that's why I drew this wall, or had someone drew this wall between uh, the geneticist and the neurobiologist, because we still do not give the exact right information to the neurobiological field that can help us to um, gain more uh, understanding of the underlying biology. We still need to do a couple of steps before we can ask them to set up a functional experiment. And that's, um, so, so that route of what are the steps in between uh, running your GWAS and generating a Manhattan plot and setting up a functional experiment that can actually give you insight into underlying biology. What are the in-between steps that we still need to do at the bioinformatic level, for example, before we can actually do this in a, in a meaningful way? So um, step one is to use these GWAS results to generate testable hy hypotheses. And I think that's crucial. So the outcome of a GWAS is the Manhattan plot. It's just a table of statistical association. And it doesn't really give you any testable hypothesis. It, it, yeah, it, it's a little bit naive to think that if we have 108 loci that are associated with your trade, to say that we have 108 testable uh, hypotheses. So this is not something that can actually be tested in a functional experiment. We need to first connect the dots between these 108 loci or between these 500 loci that we have found from a GWAS and then generate a hypothesis on the underlying biology um, and not generate a hypothesis on every single gene or every single locus, uh, I believe, uh, and then set up that experiment and then actually conduct these experiments. So there's a couple of challenges uh, before we can do this. So the first challenge is LD, a linkage disequilibrium. I think most of you or many of you uh, are well aware with this concept. So GWAS typically doesn't give us the single causal variant, but it gives us a locus of uh, correlated um, uh, genetic variants that will all show you a statistical significant association. And it's very uncertain what is the actual uh, causal variant. Uh, and just, just a brief example, uh, so this is one locus associated with, uh, I believe this was schizophrenia. Um, no, I'm not complete, completely sure, but um, so this is one locus where we find one very significant associated SNP, but all of the other uh, genetic variants that are uh, correlated to this genetic variant due to LD uh, also show a very high uh, statistical association. And that means that there's a lot of genes indicated. So here we see many genes in this region that, and all of them might be plausible candidates uh, of being the, the actual causally associated gene. And maybe all of them are, maybe one gene is associated, maybe two or maybe three. We don't even know how many genes uh, would be indicated. Um, so yeah, basically the end point of our, our GWAS 
is this block of associated variants without knowing what is the actual uh, causal candidate. So that's one very um, challenging factor, because if we want to set up a functional experiment, we want to be able to say to our neurobiological colleagues, well, this gene with this particular genetic variant that, for example, increases the transcription of this gene uh, needs to be investigated because uh, an increased transcription of this gene has been linked to a higher risk of association uh, with the disease. But we can't really say from, uh, from these results because we cannot further zoom in, um, in into this locus. Uh, but obviously there are a couple of ways that we can actually use. So uh, one solution would be to assume that every genetic variant that we know, that we already know to have um, a deleterious effect, for example, is more likely to be causally associated with the disease than any variant that we currently do not know to have a, a biological function. So that will be one uh, assumption that we can, can make. And then you can already select some of the genetic variants that are more likely to be causally associated than some of the other variants. Um, a second solution would be um, to do Bayesian uh, um, Bayesian fine mapping, statistical fine mapping, where we use the observed uh, pattern of uh, statistical association and also use the uh, known pattern of um, LD correlation between genetic variants and then um, use Bayesian testing um, to come up with what is the most likely model of how many causal variants are most likely associated and what is the most likely associated variant in this region. So solutions to this challenge are basically twofold. So one is functional annotation, um, just to annotate uh, what are the SNPs that are more likely to be functional. So and, and then assuming that those are also the ones that are more likely to be causally associated. Um, and uh, the other one is statistical fine mapping. And of course, for functional annotation, we have to keep in mind that this information is dynamic. So if we currently annotate our SNPs with the information that we currently have, uh, that might completely change in a couple of years when we have more information, for, for example, and especially on regulatory information. So this is a dynamic process that can be redone uh, every now and then. So uh, a second challenge in interpreting our GWAS outcome and generating testable hypothesis from GWAS is that many of our GWAS sets are in non-coding regions. And that means uh, that are not um, immediately linked to genes. Uh, and that's not so strange that they are in non-coding region because most of the genome is non-coding. So um, we actually looked at um, a couple of years ago at how many of the GWAS hits that we currently have are in non-coding regions, for example. So this is from a paper that was published by uh, Kyoko Watanabe. Um, and here we found that the majority of SNPs in trait associated loci are in non-coding region. But that's not very strange because it's actually in line with what we already know from the whole genome. So the majority of SNPs lies in non-coding region. Um, and only 2.4% of SNPs in trait associated with iron coding region. But that's actually a little bit higher than uh, what we see in the rest of the genome. So there's a, a slight overview presentation of um, statistical associations with diseases in coding regions compared to the background of the genome. <clears throat> but also a large proportion of SNPs in trait associated loci are likely regulatory. Uh, and um, yeah, well, I think that's common knowledge right now, but it's very interesting to know that, um, that we should also look at not only at what is, how does the structure of a protein change, but also what is the transcription regulation of a gene, for example, and how does that affect um, our risk for disease. So that's also uh, a challenge that can be overcome by uh, annotating. So if we annotate the SNPs in, um, in our risk loci, and we annotate them for, especially with functional information uh, about regulatory processes such as uh, EQTLs, for example, or chromatin interactions, then they, we can still link our non-coding regions to genes uh, or to genes that are influenced by these non-coding regions. And that would still help us to generate hypotheses probably, uh, and, and to also to, um, to come up with what is the most likely uh, causal gene in region. So the third challenge in interpreting our GWAS outcome is uh, that most of our traits are very polygenic and that most of the uh, effect sizes are also very small. Therefore, that's also what we 
seen uh, with that um, beautiful uh, GWAS schizophrenia in 2014, but it's also very common for many of the brain-related disorders to have, um, yeah, to have uh, many loci with, with, with multiple very small effects. Um, and even if we would then be able to say from every locus pinpoint what is the most likely causal gene, then because the effect sizes are very small, it's still very difficult to set up a functional experiment because in functional experiments, we, we don't speak about the same sample sizes that we currently use for GWAS. We used to have uh, a couple of mice, uh, mouse, uh, or a couple of cell lines, for example, or a couple of mice, um, a couple, maybe tens or 20. Uh, and so it's definitely not a million individuals in those functional experiments. So the effect sizes need to be much larger uh, in order to detect uh, meaningful differences between cases and controls. So that's also um, a, a problem, I think, a challenge. So one of the solutions to this challenge would be to map associated SNPs to genes and to see whether they somehow converge uh, in biological function or maybe in where they are expressed or what time they are expressed. So here we could say, well, from all of these small effect genes, we know that maybe 30% of all of those genes are expressed in the same time uh, in the same uh, cellular location, and they're all involved in the same biological function. If that's the case, then we could uh, generate a hypothesis based on that biological function occurring at that particular time point and occurring at that particular location. And um, yeah, we, our experiment could be designed towards investigating whether that makes a difference between uh, cases and controls. And we don't have to focus on the single genes um, because each of those genes only have a very, has a very small effect. So this is something um, that we, but also many others have uh, also done, where we've done gene set analysis um, for, uh, for a couple of traits. So this is uh, one of our recent uh, papers that we published, I think, last year for insomnia, uh, where we did, uh, where we ran um, first the GWAS for insomnia using Eukobiobank and also 23andMe samples. And then uh, we ran a gene set analysis based on the GWAS summary statistics to see whether there was any enrichment in certain sets um, certain biological functions, but also uh, whether we could find any regions in the brain that were enriched for genes that were highly associated with insomnia or cell types. And here we actually did find um, types of cells um, that are associated with, um, with, with the differences between cases and controls for insomnia. And we also found enrichments for certain tissue types, for example. <clears throat> now, this is an area that um, so this is a, a, yeah, a method that's currently being quite mainstream, I think, to be used in uh, um, when people run a GWAS analysis. You do your GWAS, then you do a gene set analysis, of you include cell type analysis. Um, but what we're currently working on is to see you know, how exactly do we need to run this cell type analysis. So um, in this initial analysis, we assumed that the genes that are most highly associated uh, on the statistical level with the risk for insomnia are also the ones that are more strongly expressed in a certain cell type. But obviously that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. It could also be the case that it's the other way around. They are less strongly expressed or maybe it's not about the level of expression, but it's more about the variability in the expression. So maybe it's the case that the genes that are important for a certain trait are the least variable uh, in their expression in a certain cell type, um, yeah, something like that. So th there are many different ways of analyzing um, cell type enrichment. And uh, one of our uh, PIs uh, in my lab, uh, Rachel Brouwer, together with Tanja Kroon, they are sorting out many different statistical methods to see what is the best way uh, to, to look at enrichment for uh, tissue type, brain regions, or cell types um, when we use GWAS as, as input. Um, I, I don't have the results on the, on, on the slide uh, yet, but the preliminary results actually point towards um, if we use like 20 or 30 different methods they, that differ in, um, in the underlying statistical method, uh, we don't really see a very clear pattern. It's not the case that there's convergence of different statist statistical methods that all point towards the same um, outcome. So that means that it, it, it seems to be yeah, very difficult to, um, without any underlying biological information about how um, genes that are associated with a certain trait, how they would affect 
um, the, the genes function in a cell type without any of that knowledge, it's very difficult to design a statistical method to test for enrichment that is actually meaningful. Any method that we design gives us statistical uh, significant output. So it's not the case that we lack any um, uh, statistical uh, significance, um, but we just don't know what is the truth. Uh, we, we don't know whether the genes that are most highly um, associated with a certain disease are also the ones that are most highly expressed, for example. So it's very difficult to benchmark this. And uh, we're currently working on um, seeing whether we can find a way to do so, but also collaborating with um, biologists to know what is uh, the most, um, most optimal way to do this. Okay, so one thing to keep in mind is that um, if we are not able to prioritize the correct gene from a locus, so if, uh, if we still have these loci where there's many different genes that are all statistically associated, but we're not sure what is the actual causal um, gene, and we have this pattern of association due to LD, then uh, most of the genetic variants and most of the genes in the loci will actually be just statistical byproducts. So if we use this information, so these summary statistics in our gene set enrichment analysis, we have like maybe 90% of the genetic um, uh, statistical associations that are statistical byproducts and that, that are not uh, causally meaningful. Uh, so picking the right gene from a locus it's just really crucial before we start doing our gene set enrichment analysis. And um, there's a lot of uh, work uh, from, um, from other groups. Hilary van Nucken, for example, is working on this. Um, but also um, we have started a smaller project to look at what is the most optimal way uh, using Bayesian statistics and machine learning to pick the right gene from a locus. And uh, before we start doing our gene set enrichment analysis, and we've already seen in our preliminary analysis that this actually does make a difference. So um, I would like to keep this in mind. And there's a new tool from our lab that will come out um, in a couple of months, hopefully. It's called Flames. So maybe keep an eye on this from, uh, from Marijn Schipper, one of our PhD students. So some of the tools that I would like to highlight um, from the lab that we've um, been developed and already uh, mentioned uh, by, by Anders in the introduction is uh, FUMA, which can be used for functional uh, annotation of genetic uh, results, and MAGMA, which can be used for gene set analysis, and LAVA, which was um, developed uh, just um, one or two years ago by Joseph in Verma, which can be used for local genetic correlation. So we'll briefly um, explain a little bit more about these tools in depth. So FUMA um, was developed by Kyoko, one of our PhD students, but she left to work with um, a pharmaceutical company. And the tools are still being maintained by a group of people in my lab um, that are actively uh, updating the FUMA tool with, um, with new external resources, for example, but also helping people to, um, uh, with, with any questions that they have. So it's, very, uh, it's, it's still actively being maintained. So FUMA is a tool that you can use if you would like to annotate your GWAS summary statistics. So you've already run your GWAS, and then you've generated your Manhattan plot, but then you want to know what's actually going on in your risk loci. Uh, so there's a lot of tools you can use, like ANOVAR, or you can link your uh, GWAS summary statistics to the GTEx database, for example, but that's very difficult to do. So we, uh, we generated this, uh, this tool to that, that uses other tools. So it, FUMA is not really a new method. It just connects a lot of other tools together to help you uh, quickly interpret your GWAS uh, summary statistics. So you upload your GWAS results, and then it gives you a lot of output uh, in terms of tables uh, with annotations, but also a lot of visual output that uh, helps you to, um, to connect the dots a little bit. Um, so uh, yeah, th this is a, a brief overview of what you can do. So once you upload your GWAS summary statistic, it will define your risk loci. It will also generate Manhattan and QQ plots for you to check whether FUMA actually um, read your data in the correct way. Then it will run gene-based and gene set analysis. It will uh, annotate all of the SNPs in all of your risk loci with all of the resources that you clicked uh, on uh, that you want to use. Um, and then it also uh, maps um, uh, genetic variants in the risk loci to genes using positional mapping uh, to see whether a SNP is actually in a gene, EQTL mapping, which means uh, linking SNPs to genes via EQTL, 
ruminations and chromatin interaction uh, mapping. Um, so you get a list of why uh, certain SNPs are linked to genes uh, for every risk loci. It also looks up the SNPs in the GWAS catalog to see whether there are previous associations with the same SNPs in your risk loci. And then it gives you these uh, visualizations to, um, yeah, to help facilitate um, looking at your data. Um, yeah. So MAGMA uh, is a tool that was developed um, almost 10 years ago, I think, to do gene-based analysis and gene-set analysis. And um, it's, yeah, it, it can be used also um, within the FUMA framework. So if you go to the FUMA website, we also have uh, MAGMA behind the scenes that will run uh, gene-based and gene-set analysis for you. And um, one of the latest additions to the MAGMA tool is to do a conditional gene set analysis, which means that you can run your gene set analysis, get your output, um, your list of gene sets that are associated with your trait, but then many of the gene sets that we use are not independent. So there's many overlap between genes that are part of one, two or three different sets of genes. And if that's the case, you would like to know whether your genetic associations are driven by the genes that are member of multiple different sets of genes, or whether it's actually um, the, 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 the actual function of those sets of genes that's important. So um, using this conditional gene set analysis uh, allows you to, uh, to test for dependencies or independencies between uh, different sets of genes. And that's uh, the reason why I mentioned that it's, it's important in the context of um, cell type enrichment analysis, for example. So if you would do a cell type enrichment analysis, you have a list of cell types with the expression levels of uh, genes, for example, uh, and you would like to test for enrichment of your uh, GWAS signal in, uh, in any of these cell types using gene set analysis, then it's important to realize that many of the genes are ex expressed in many different cell types. So the same genes are expressed in different cell types, and therefore cell, type, uh, cell types are not independent from each other in, uh, if, when you characterize them based on uh, the expression level of genes. And therefore it's very important to also look uh, at conditional um, gene set analysis Otherwise, your conclusion will be that cell type 1 to 10 are all associated with your trait, but basically it's just one set of genes and the expression level of that set of genes is important and that drives all of those 10 associations with your trait. Anyway, so that's, uh, I just wanted to mention that, um, so I think that's, uh, that's important. So uh, one of the uh, additions that we um, made to FUMA a couple of years ago in combination with MAGMA is to um, allow uh, cell type um, enrichment analysis also after you upload your summary statistic um, by including uh, publicly available single cell RNA transcriptomics data resources. So we found 43 different um, data sets um, that we could use to look at um, cell type enrichment analysis. We um, QC them, we uploaded them to FUMA, uh, made them ready to be used in the MAGMA framework and then um, we applied them uh, to um, many of the different uh, geo summary statistics that are out there. And just to show um, that you can actually find cell types uh, based on, uh, on geo summary statistic data. So if you would like to, to know exactly how this works, then I would like to refer you to this paper here where the exact method is, uh, is explained in more detail. Uh, but it's just to illustrate that, you know, even if you uh, if, you, if you don't know exactly how to do a cell type enrichment analysis, you can easily now upload your data to FUMA and then um, you will have that ready um, yeah, in uh, maybe a couple hours. Okay, so we already and others applied this to uh, a lot of um, papers recently, um, but there's also, we also generated uh, and one of the um, recent um, results that I would like to highlight a little bit more is from the Alzheimer PGC working group um, which was an analysis run by Douglas Whiteman, who's um, a final year PC student in my group currently, uh, currently writing his uh, introduction and, uh, and discussion to his thesis. So he, um, he, he led the, the, the second GWAS for the PGC Alzheimer group, and he found um, 38 risk loci and also a couple of new um, novel reasons, but he also applied these functional gene set analysis. And, um, he found, and one of the things that he found 
was, for example, that expression of Alzheimer genes are enriched uh, mostly in human microglia. And uh, that's something that was not completely unknown from the Alzheimer field because that was already implicated from, uh, from research in mouse studies. But never before had this been implicated um, based on human GWAS studies. So this is just to illustrate that we can actually use human GWAS results um, to find biology that we already know to be meaningful for a certain traits. Um, and uh, well, there's, there's other examples also from other traits, but I also find it nice that we could find this for a trait like Alzheimer, um, which is uh, yeah, quite a complex trait uh, uh, in humans. Okay, there's also uh, another website that I would briefly like to mention that we set up um, where we uh, combined um, all of the um, GWAS results that came out until a couple of years ago, uh, and we put everything together in, uh, in the atlas, in, into the GWAS atlas. So this database contains summary statistics that are publicly available up until, I think, um, 2020. Uh, to, to 2018. Uh, we're currently updating it with some statistics that came out in the last couple of years. But here you can query very quickly any uh, GWAS result that, that has been published and that did put up their results um, um, pu just publicly available. And this is just an example of what you can do. So if you type in one trait, um, you can quickly find a Manhattan plot for the trait. It will run for you a, a gene-based analysis, so it will also give you a gene-based Manhattan plot. Uh, it will do a gene set analysis for you, it will give you the QQ plot, it will give you uh, tables with uh, the most, um, uh, most, statistic most highly statistically associated genes and, and SNPs. So it's, it's a very quick, quick and dirty way maybe, because it, we didn't do any other further quality control of the publicly available uh, data that was out there. It's just, you know, whatever people uh, did themselves, that's what we also use. So this is how it was published, obviously. Um, but if you want to have a quick indication of a certain trait, or maybe look at many different traits and how um, uh, increasing sample size, for example, change their Manhattan plots, then this is a, a database that you can quickly use. You can also use it uh, to combine um, multiple different traits. So here we generated within the GWAS Atlas database um, a plot where we look at uh, genetic correlations. So this is just selecting multiple different phenotypes and then generating a plot using L-disco regression uh, to look at uh, genetic correlations. And uh, one other thing, one last final thing I would like to mention here is that you can also uh, do a FIWA spot. So instead of um, looking uh, at the Manhattan plot where we have um, on the on the x-axis x -axis genetic variants, now we have uh, on the, now we have for one genetic variant or for one gene, you can choose whether you want one single SNP or one single gene. Then every dot here indicates the statistical association of that gene with any of the trait that is any of the phenotypes that are in, included in uh, this database. So this is an example for the DRD2 gene, where um, you have the minus log 10 uh, of the p-value of the association on the y-axis um, for all of the traits um, in this database. So that's also something that you can look up very quickly in GWAS Atlas. So the last tool I would like to um, highlight a little bit more detail is LAVA, which was developed by Josephine Wermer together with Christian de Leeuw, um, um, basically to do uh, local genetic correlations. So, and, and, and also to gain a better insight into uh, to pleiotropy. So I think this doesn't really need a lot of introduction. Um, what is genetic correlation? It's a ge yeah, correlation on the level of, uh, of genes. And we know already from uh, the brainstorm paper, for example, or there's some other papers as well, that we already see a lot of genetic correlations, especially between brain-related traits, but also all of the psychiatric traits correlate very highly. Um, but there's, yeah, there's, there's really a high level of uh, pleiotropy across the whole genome. Now, there's a couple of, um, uh, a couple of underlying uh, things that can go on if we, have, um, if we look at global versus local genetic correlations. So in a global genetic correlation, we can find a genetic correlation that is, for example, zero. But that doesn't mean that across the whole genome, uh, the genetic correlation is, is zero everywhere. It could, it could actually be the case that there are many genetic correlations that are highly positive, 
but that they are neutralized with many other correlations that are highly negative. And therefore, we find a net zero global correlation. But at a local level, there might be a lot of information present. So all of these different scenarios are actually very interesting um, to further investigate if we are interested in uh, further understanding why uh, traits are, um, are related at a genetic level. So um, there are some existing local genetic correlation methods like Rohes, Supernova, and Loka Detect. But we wanted to develop a method where we could include multiple phenotypes at the same time and also have a very uh, easy to use um, R packets available. So this is why we uh, developed uh, LAVA. It actually, it's a three-step procedure. It first uh, conducts a univariate test where we confirm the local uh, heritability of a trait. Then we do a pairwise local genetic correlation uh, and then we can do multi multivariate tests for more than two traits. So this could be uh, 10 traits uh, at the same time, for example. And this is an example of what output from LAVA could look like. So this is where we looked at multiple phenotypes, just um, two by two um, genetic correlations at the local level. And then um, you have information of the number of significant and low side that are correlating, uh, and also what the percentage of um, genetic correlation uh, is for every trait. So it, yeah, it gives you just a little bit more insight. Instead of just one number, that's a global correlation of across the whole genome, how do these two traits correlate with each other? And is these, are these correlations negative or are they positive? Um, and yeah, it just gives you a little bit more feel for what's going on in the genome. You could also do something like this, where uh, we generated them. Manhattan plot, um, but then um, plotted all of the local genetic correlations between, in this case, depression and regional brain volume. And here you see that some of the areas have a very strong correlation between these two traits. And that might give you some indication of what's going on in a specific locus. So why, um, why do we see um, statistical significance for depression, and could that maybe be explained by another gene that's also associated with regional brain volume? And you can ask the same question for gene expression. So in this case, it's almost it's very um, very related to uh, to a TWAS analysis, for example, where we would look for at the local level can we use local genetic correlations to explain the genetic signal that we see in. A locus and that helps us also maybe uh, to prioritize genes uh, because we already know that they are linked to other traits that might also be uh, linked to uh, to your uh, trait of interest so um, yeah so that's what we can uh, can do with uh, with lava um, so we do have to say that lava is is about correlation it doesn't give you a causal uh, insight yet for that we would uh, yeah, you need to use other approaches, obviously. Okay, um, yeah, so getting to the end. So if we want to go from GWAS to function, uh, then one of the most important things is to interpret our GWAS risk loci. So step one, I think, is to annotate, to, to try to understand our GWAS uh, results. What do we see in our risk loci? Um, get as much biological information as we can, annotate all of that and try to connect the dots within each locus, but also across loci uh, to interpret polygenicity. And so to annotate every locus by itself, but also connect the dots between the different loci to see whether we find enrichment for certain uh, types of cells or for certain timing of expression or for certain areas in the brain or certain biological functions. And then based on this generate hypothesis and set up functional experience to test mechanisms. Now, um, I think this um, sounds logical, I think, but it, it, it's still very difficult uh, to do. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> but I think it's very important. And we just, um, um, just in 2019, we received a very large grant from the Dutch government, uh, mainly basically to do this, to use GWAS results to um, to try the best we can to interpret our results and then to set up meaningful hypotheses, to, to come up with meaningful hypotheses, to set up experiments and to actually carry out functional experiments um, that might um, gain new insight into biology for um, brain disorders. <clears throat> so that's um, a very large project, which I will briefly describe to you in the next slide. It's called Brainscapes. Uh, um, 
uh, it's it's a Dutch project, so there's uh, there's no money that goes out of the Netherlands, but there's a lot of collaboration between uh, some of the partners in our consortium and the Ellen Brain Institute. So we connect very closely with the resources that come out of um, the Ellen Brain Institute for single cell RNA sequencing, for example. So this is what the project is about. We um, we basically decided in the beginning to focus on cell types. This is not something that we would want to keep focusing on for the next 10 years. If, if we think that an, another strategy makes more sense, we would definitely do that. But this is our initial, our initial focus. So we have one work package where we do all of the bioinformatics and computation. So basically this is where we work with the GWAS data, where we interpret the GWAS data, where we annotate all of the results and try to connect the dots and uh, to generate hypotheses. And in this case, we try to generate hypotheses on which cell type is most likely to be associated with which, um, which phenotype. And then in the next work package, we try to validate these cell types of brain disorders using um, brain data from the human brain bank, and then uh, uh, use single cell RNA sequencing and, um, and 2D and 3D expression mapping to see whether we can actually validate uh, differences between cases and controls in the cell types that were indicated in the first work package um, for, uh, for a certain disease based on GWAS data. And then in the third work package, we, um, we aim to determine functional connectivity of cells. So here we try to map the circuitry uh, in which uh, the specific cell types that came out of work package one and two, um, uh, that, that the, the cell types that were selected there, in which circuitries they are most active and to map those circuitries. And then in the fourth work package, we try to establish a causal role using um, mouse models and uh, use cell-specific intervention using DREAD technology and behavioral models um, that are important for certain disease to see whether we can actually um, yeah, detect um, a causal role of cell types and, and map the circuitry and how it's important and related to behavioral models that are uh, relevant for disease. And then we have a, a fifth work package, which is our think tank, where we try to, um, to um, generate a spin of projects that come up from each of these work packages, but um, that, um, that actually would need to set up experiments that we currently do not have in-house ourselves. So in this this work package, for example, we would like to collaborate with pharmaceutical companies, which often have um, experimental setups uh, where they can quickly test for a certain pharmaceutical uh, co component um, using uh, cell type, uh, using the cell types, for example, that we have generated, or using the cell lines that we have generated. So here we uh, are ready to go as soon as we have uh, meaningful results uh, from the other um, from the other work packages. Yeah, so in uh, in conclusion, I would like to say that um, GWAS field has really matured over the past 15 years. I, I, I still think it's a very exciting field to work in, especially for brain disorders, um, with these increasing sample sizes and these large initiatives like Eucobiobank, but also like 23andMe, where we can share data, where many researchers have access to lots of data, which allows us not only to uh, apply um, our, met our methods to, um, to use data sets, but also to use these used data sets to develop novel methods and to better sort out, you know, how, how do things work? How do we need to improve our methods and how do we need to improve technology to, uh, to get a very, to get a better understanding? Uh, I also think it's very exciting that we're currently seeing a much uh, closer connection between geneticists on the, on the one hand and neurobiologists on the, on the other hand where I previously thought that there was really, you know, like this different language that we were speaking. Um, there was this big wall that's still a little bit there. But I also think that we're closely connecting now to, um, to better understand what do we geneticists need to give people that are actually doing functional experiments and what do they need to ask from us to be able to together uh, gain more insight into underlying biology. Okay. But well, with that, I would like to thank, uh, and uh, this is my lab, still during Corona time, a couple of years ago, uh, which is when uh, we did uh, a social event. It was a bingo where everyone had to take on a sexy pose uh, and get points and, uh, well, to stay happy during Corona. But uh, I'm happy that this is no longer necessary. Well, thanks for listening, and uh, I'm happy to, uh, to answer any questions.
Great, thank you very much, uh, Danielle, for this uh, fantastic lecture. Um, I mean, it was, uh, you really described and delineated very much, uh, very well, all the, the, uh, a lot of the obstacles that we meet when we try to, to make biological sense out of the, of the GYS hits. And uh, you also pointed to some of the, uh, the solutions, or at least some, some, some roadmaps towards solutions. And as, as I understand, we, and I also agree, that we're probably not quite there yet in terms of delivering really strong, testable hypotheses for, for the neurobiologists, but uh, we are certainly getting closer. And that's very much thanks to you, uh, Danielle, and, and many others in the field. Uh, so uh, I'd like to open up uh, this uh, uh, keynote for questions, and also I would like to maybe introduce our moderator for this uh, oh, session. Louise, yeah. Is that Louise? Yeah. yeah. Hello. Hello, Louise. Come up here and help me. Uh, <laughs> Hi, yeah, I'm Louise Hukey um, from the Libre Institute for Brain Development, and I'll be representing the uh, virtual questions here today. So, thanks. So, there's a question up at the back row there. Hello, Daniela. Hilary Martin. Oh, yeah. Thank you for a nice talk. A uh, question about the local genetic correlation analyses. So I'm sure you saw this, this recent paper in Science about uh, assorted mating generating, uh, being a source of, of global genetic correlations. And I'm just, this is a bit of a half-baked thought, but I just wondered if you'd thought more about whether these local genetic correlations could give us any insights about that. Um, yeah. You mean whether the um, uh, local co co correlation could give insight into inbreeding or well, sort of really mating, just, right? just you know, fi uh, uh, like figuring out to what extent the global genetic correlations are simply driven by assortative mating versus kind of real shared biology, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's actually something that we're currently looking into. It's uh, I, I don't think it's very straightforward. So I don't have a straightforward answer to that. Uh, it's a bit tricky, I think, to answer now, but. Uh, I know Josephine and Christian are, are trying to work that out and see whether we can actually use that to uh, maybe assess uh, the level of assortative mating. Um, but yeah, um, yeah it, uh, I think it's very important to uh, at least to take that into account. But I don't have a straight answer to that right now. So yeah, I was, I was actually, comment. thanks very much, and thanks for the tools. I think we used every single one of the tools you put <laughs> So, <laughs> so uh, we're grateful. Um, I think the, uh, what I was going to ask you is two questions, actually. One of them is, what's the impact on the single-cell RNA-seq enrichment analyses of missing data? So how concerned are you about when you're not including cell types that haven't been sufficiently delineated or where you've got clusters as a single nuclear world kind of expands and single-cell world expands? They're going to be cell types identified which are not included in your analysis initially, and you might start assigning heritability to a cell type um, simply because the real cell type wasn't there. So the kind of impact of missing data. Um, the other thing I was going to ask you about was, um, in a way, the, the player trophy question, which was just: Do you think that the unit of information being a gene is just intrinsically incorrect? And so, if we think that you know. Uh, disorders have relationships to each other because we're assigning risk to genes. Um, in a sense, the unit should be a transcript, maybe, and consequently, you know, we're, we're overstating those relationships. Um, and that's why the data can come across as confusing or um, there can be relationships between diseases which maybe shouldn't be there. So yeah, on yeah very good question. So, so the first question is, um, what happens if we, if we do not include the actual cell type that, uh, that we should? Yeah, so I think that that's one of the problems that we're currently struggling with also because cell types are not actually not clearly defined. It seems to more like a quantitative measure of cell type. Um, so one parallel route that we're trying to do is what if we do not consider cell types to be specific categories but to see them as a quantitative measure also in our models. And maybe that helps, that better help. Still, then we could um, exclude a certain cell type that's not there. There's new cell type being uh, discovered as we speak, I think. Um, yeah, so that, that can definitely, yeah, if, if it's not there, we will definitely miss it. And there's no way to indicate that we missed it. So there's no way to know. So yeah, 
So that's why I think we, we do need, you know, these large initiatives from the Allen Brain Institute or from other institutes that are, you know, sorting out what are all the cell types in the human brain, uh, but also especially looking at the overlap between mouse and human models, because there's still a lot of mouse models that are being used and it's not all the same cell type, for example. So that's also something that's important if we find enrichment for a cell type that's actually a mouse cell type. Um, is that then important for humans? Uh, we also need to know a little bit about that. And did we then maybe miss something in humans? Or So yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think we, the only answer I can give is that we just need more effort um, from biologists or neuroscientists to, uh, to charge specific cell types. Um, so your second question, what's the second question again? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it was, Can you say one more? Yeah, it was just actually about whether the natural unit of information should be a gene oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. or yeah. whether it should be a yeah. transcript, and that might help. Yeah, yeah. So we've been thinking about that also a little bit. So I thought so. Previously, the unit of uh, investigation was the gene, right? So everything was centered around the gene. The gene was was finding the most likely causal gene, and then the functional experiment was the most causal gene. Um, so in this large brainscape consortium, um, we try to move away a little bit from the unit of analysis as the gene, but then go to cell type. Um, but then obviously, we still use genes as intermediate step to get to the cell type. And what you're saying, yeah, maybe we should use uh, the, the transcript or maybe we should use um, something else. And I think that's something that's only, you know, people have only started to think about that now because we have more biological information that allows us to realize that that might be important. So I think we should keep an open mind to that. And, you know, to, to, I don't think at the statistical level it would be difficult to, uh, to integrate in, that into our models. But as soon as we have that information, we can easily integrate that. And instead of a gene-based analysis, we could do a gene transcript analysis. We could integrate um, those uh, different analyses. So that's all feasible as long as we know, know what to look for. Uh, and that's also important to keep that connection with people that do the actual wet lab experiments that tell us, you know, the transcripts, um, these are all the transcripts and, uh, and look at that. That's, I think that's definitely very important. It's just something that traditionally people didn't do because we, yeah, that's how we used to think, right? Yeah, but it's important to, uh, to do that. Uh, uh, if we could do a question from the virtual chat before um, we break here. Um, so we have a question from Laura Dutero. Um, is it common to use 23andMe data for GWAS? Is the rise of at-home gene testing useful for this kind of work? Sorry, is, is it common to use 23andMe data for GWAS and then? Uh, let me just repeat the question here. Um, is it common to use 23andMe data for GWAS? Is the rise of at-home gene testing useful for this kind of work? Yeah, I can't hear the last part. Ooh, is the okay. <laughs> oh, is it this mic? Oh, no, no, you just um, I think it's just at home. Oh. At, at home testing or direct to consumer testing. Mm. So, the role of direct to consumer testing in GWAS analyses. Um, so, so, where you've got testing that's conducted by the, the individual themselves, not part of a research study, and they've also self reported their phenotypes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I really like um, to be able to use that. It's just another resource that's out there. And they, they, the, the good thing about 23andMe or maybe other initiatives like 23andMe is that they are huge. They have like over 10 million individuals. Uh, and therefore, if knowing that uh, the data is self-report, but because the sample size is so huge, you can, um, you can have a little bit of error. And it still gives you, um, it still gives you some results. Uh, so I, I would always say, well, if it's there, please do use it. Um, but it's not like the best, most refined data set out there. So if I would have all the money in the world, obviously I would go out there and collect my own data and uh, have it uh, in a much better quality. But uh, yeah, I think it's, it's nice to use. If you can use it, then I would use it. Yeah. So I think we have only time for one more question, a final question, perhaps in the third row, fourth row. Um, so just a question for you, uh, Dutch uh, big grant. You uh, mentioning mouse models, uh, but not iPS cells. So you do not consider iPS cells uh, an important model to understand the biology? 
Yes, definitely. We, we did not include it in this grant, um, um, which is maybe a little bit strange because also in my lab we have an IPSC lab. Um, but that's because we are currently really sorting out all of the heterogeneity between different cell lines uh, that were generated using IPC lines, uh, both in 2D and 3D structures. So we, we, we just thought it was a little bit too tricky. Did we lose uh, Daniel? I think we did. Oh. At least uh, she's not moving anymore. <laughs> so she's probably also in need for some coffee as we are, I guess. I don't know, no, it's not a coffee break. I think it's, we have a planned very short break, like five minutes or so. So for just stretching your legs or something. So again, big thanks to Danielle for her talk and thanks to you for your questions.